Welcome to my YouTube subscribers. My guest on Facing the Canon today is Lord Michael Hastings, a leader and a servant. Michael Hastings, welcome to Facing the Canon. Thank you, thank you. Great An to be with you, John. An absolute delight, Michael. Yeah. We were both reminiscing a moment ago that we've known each other for three decades. Exactly that, and maybe another 30 to go. And maybe, well, God willing, and we've been great friends, we think, for about 23 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you're a, a remarkable man, and uh, you wear remarkable things. So I'm going to start with that. Tell us <laughs> about your, li your little badge there. What's that? So this, this was given to me by the chief executive of one of the biggest companies in the world. He had, was taking a set of bullets that were used during a major conflict in sub-Saharan Africa, had them pressed into shape. So there is a gold ring around the multiple colors. The gold ring stands for the golden rule. Do to others as you would wish them to do to you. That's exactly what Jesus encouraged us to be about. And inside the 17 sustainable development goals of the United Nations, these are the targets set by the UN 2010 to 2030. These are the objectives for ensuring the end of extreme poverty wow, and hunger. That is so good. Now, your, your Lord Michael Hastings, yes. okay, wh when were you appointed as a Lord? Oh, if I dig back into the recesses of my mind, 2005. Yeah, so, and, and you are a neutral Lord? Independent. And, independent. Yes, okay. or crossbencher, meaning angry with all the rest, but oh, sitting in between, sitting, sitting in, in between. between. Yeah. Okay, so just for those viewers who are maybe unfamiliar uh, with how our politics works, how, what's the difference between the House of Commons and the House of Lords? Well, MPs get money and they're paid. And uh, we're in the House of Lords are voluntary and only receive expenses. That's the first thing to lay on the table. Uh, members of Parliament in the, in the lower house, the House of Commons, uh, go to election every four to five years. It's five years at the moment under the Parliament Act, but it could be varied. Uh, they go to election. At the point at which they go to election, they cease to be MPs, and then they have to get the approval of their constituency or their area that they can come back to Parliament, and then they have a five-year run. We are appointed in the House of Lords by the Queen, who ensures that our continuity is permanent. So we don't go to election. We are permanently in place, a bit like in the case of the United States, the members of the Supreme Court are permanently in place. Uh, our role is to cross-check legislation that comes from the House of Commons. Most law in the UK begins in the elected chamber, comes to the unelected chamber, scrutinized, changed, transformed, improved substantially, sent back. They can adopt, adapt, or uh, negate the things that we say. We have a bouncing procedure whereby the House of Lords can push back so many times and they can ultimately push us into the corner if they insist because they're the elected chamber on the behalf of the people, on behalf of manifestos. However, we also scrutinize and question ministers of government on a daily basis and we can raise issues of national concern. Our duty are to ensure that the constitution which rests in the monarch is upheld members of uh, the House of Commons, their duties to their constituents. Wow. <laughs> wow. A little lesson in constitutional <coughs> history. That is, um, well, so you are making a difference. Yes, solidly, yes. Solidly. Very, very much so. Now, I don't know where to begin when it comes to your credentials and what you've done and the places and the people that you've influenced. Uh, uh, you've worked for the BBC, you've worked for KPMG, uh, you've worked and represented different, I mean, global. And it, how would you describe what you actually do? <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose <coughs> the best place for me is to say, what was the purpose that I felt God put on my mind and therefore my heart way back when I was 16 as a school pupil and the purpose was to speak for the poor and to bend the power of the prosperous to the potential of the poor. So all... Can we go back to then? Sure. Well, you were 16, Michael. I was. What, and you, you had this, what, burden? Yes, yes, yeah. Which a friend asked me, another friend at school, actually ironically called Michael as well, asked me, what are you going to do with your life when we leave here in the long term? So what are those kind of 
two boys walking around a lake question you ask at 16. And I just came out with it. I want to speak for the poor. I want to bend the power of the prosperous to the potential of the poor. And that, is, that has been the determining guideline, anchor, uh, wh whichever way you look at it, I've always tried to associate all I've done in the media and in business with organizations and boards I've sat on, sit on, associations I make, people I work with, that I'm for the poor and I'm for bringing the wealth and potential that is out there in the real world to make sure it fits for the poor. Okay, can you give us some examples of some of the things that you've been involved in that have fulfilled that mm, vision? Mm. Well, I, there are so many wonderful ones, but let me just give you two or three quick ones. So yes. one of the things I, I was thrilled to be able to persuade KPMG to do, and this is a, a business services organization, an audit tax and business services organization, to persuade them that they should embrace the sustainable development goals but they should also then put it into practice, not just by saying, we believe in the end of extreme poverty and hunger, we believe in good water sustainability, we believe in a fair world, but how about getting involved in a really tough community, which was on an island just off the coast of Tanzania, uh, and to get involved in a complicated village of 10,000 people that had not been intruded upon by either the government of Tanzania or all the NGOs of the world, a community abandoned and left essentially to rot. No sanitation, no electrification, no, no clean running water, no jobs, no, no good housing, no schooling for the girls, and lots of children dying in, uh, in childbirth and, and people and women losing out in maternal care. And we took that task on way back in 2000, let me get this right, 2008. Uh, and when we finished the task 10 years later, 20, 2018, so a year before I retired from KPMG, we had created 5,000 jobs to employ half of the people who were there, helped to set up a bank, provided over 1,000 toilets, electrified the village, wow. um, provided telecoms infrastructure, got, got over 80% of the girls into school, seen almost no children, well, in fact, no babies um, died in the last few years because of childcare issues. So to be able to transform a place that was literally left to stink and rot, literally a place of yes. mess and defecation, yes. into a place of hope and opportunity, that's something I felt immensely and permanently proud of. That's, that, that's one vivid example. Another example would be I have a huge attachment to work a number of us do in prisons. And uh, I count many, 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 many uh, men in a particular prison in the south of England where we work uh, on, a perm on a consistent basis every two months on visits. Um, I treat them very much as dear. And, and you personally go to the prison? Oh, absolutely. I personally yes. go to the prison. Yes, this um, is not a theory. No, 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 no. No, no, no. no, no, no. I, we, I personally go. We've been going now for just over four years. Uh, we go every two months, uh, and uh, we've continued to go every two months. And, um, and we will continue with that work. But also, it's not just the visits every two months. There is a literally almost a day-to-day -day engagement with many of the men who are in prison. Uh, I have vast volumes of letters that come from them. Uh, many of them sending me the details of their cases, and I work their cases through. Some of them were able to pursue for possible early release, others that we're looking at for moving them to more open prisons, but then just supporting them through the journey of the complexity of a system that really doesn't take much notice and care for those individuals. I take really seriously what Jesus said when he said, when I was in prison, you visited me. Yeah. And then I discovered very recently, and I, to be honest, I hadn't known this fact, until this year that um, in the UK prison estate for men serving sentences longer than five years, only 9% ever get a visit, ever. That's staggering. So if a man is doing 35 years, for example, this morning I wrote to one man who's doing 35 years and to another one who's doing 27 years. Both of them were complicated cases. Both of them involved uh, life removing activity. And I wrote to both of them extensive reviews of their caseloads this morning. And both of those men would fit into the category of the unvisited. Now, if you're going to spend 35 years being unvisited, here is an opportunity for us to bring love and grace and kindness and attention and care and commitment. And that's something I really deeply, deeply treasure. That's incredible. Uh, that, I mean, that is so sad, that statistic that you've just said. Now, uh, one of those arrows in the quiver, I mean, honestly, Michael, I. You know, I've known you for a long time and um, I know that there are a lot of arrows in your quiver. And one of those arrows is um, you're, you're a professor yes. at, at a leadership institute yes. in America. Yes. Tell us about that. 
So um, many, of, many of your viewers will have read Stephen Covey's yes. remarkable book, The Seven Habits of yeah. Highly Effective People. Uh, and it, it is no, undoubtedly an iconic text of wisdom and thought from a man who knew Jesus deeply, but was also an executive management coach and trainer. And uh, his book has sold in excess of 50 million copies around the world. And there isn't a business school in the world that doesn't talk about sure. the seven habits of highly effective people. Um, and in 2019, they were kind enough to, for reasons which I, I mean, I never quite discovered, but to award me the award of being the first recipient of the Stephen R. Covey Leadership Award. Uh, and that was in reflection of their observation of my life and how I had gone about the journey of life. Um, and then they were kind enough to invite me to be a professor at Utah State University. So Stephen R. Covey created an institute which contains all his documents, his books, his thinking, his writing. Uh, it's he, obviously a foundation that is part of a business school at Utah State University. Uh, and so I am already lecturing on leadership action and principles yes. at that university. So obviously uh, you are a leader yourself. Uh, you've thought about leadership. You've engaged with leadership. Um, wh what's your observation as you look at the world globally in terms of leadership? Are, are leaders helping or do they sometimes hinder? Well, we've got to remember that um, leaders come in on both sides of the track, as it were. Um, be fair to say Adolf Hitler was a leader. Yes. And was able to convince people, as he did on three elections in Germany, to go his way. And we know what the catastrophic fallout yes. of that was. Uh, on the other hand, there are so people... Th so that would be bad leadership. That is extremely bad leadership. Of course. But, but the important thing to note about it is, it, it, let's not make the assumption that leadership is about what is always good. Yeah. Because leadership is about moving or helping to move people in a direction. Now, we would want, you and I would both want people all to go in a positive commitment direction that embraced the truth that Jesus said and lived and died for and rose again for. We want them to embrace that truth. We want them to live the realities of those truths and therefore make these convictions and commitments to life-giving energy all over the world, be the saturated presence of the love of God around the world, uh, in acts of generosity and commitment. So, But there are other people whose leadership draws them exactly the other way towards the desires of hell and the destruction of the world itself. Uh, so the, my observation about leadership would be that it's not in the title somebody is given, whether that, you know, it, this was a wonderful thing that um, President Barack Obama said after he left office, he said that uh, the most important role any of us can play in life is not to be president or prime minister, not to be king or queen, chief executive or chairman, not to be the person in charge or think of ourselves as the boss. It is to be a citizen. Yeah. And Jesus made it very clear that the last act that he did with the men who were around him was to, to get on his knees with a bowl of water and a towel and wash their feet. And he said to them, I've shown you what to do, now you do likewise. So leadership is on your knees. Yeah. And one of the most, I think, contemporary greatest leaders that we've got in the world right now is Angela Merkel in yeah. Germany. And uh, 2021 will be an interesting year for her um, as to whether she remains in office or probably doesn't remain in office. However, that said, show us the abundant speeches made by yes. Angela Merkel. They don't exist. Because she leads, as Time magazine said, from behind. Yeah. She, she draws people close to wisdom and helps and empowers them to make good decisions to go forward. And she doesn't take the stage. No, no. But that example of Jesus, you know, um, it's servant leadership. Servant leadership, Washing it is. Washing the feet. Yes. Yeah, it's not lording it over people. No. No. It's, what, it's what sitting was, with them. It's sitting with them. Yeah, absolutely. And I've seen that in business. I have seen chief executives and chairman of some of the largest global corporations in the world show that potent empathy. And a really key quality of leadership is empathy towards the hearts and needs of the marginalized and the weakest, as well as the potential of the brightest, the brainiest, and the most, the most skilled. Absolutely, yes. Um, 
sadly, over these recent months, uh, Michael, as you know, there have been various tragedies and uh, there's, there's been uh, the, the rise of Black Lives Matter. Um, what's going on there? What is really going on there is a, a very current, a very current and angry reaction and expression of a long held tale of racial discrimination, oppression, and now evident murder. It is not easy to be a black young man in the United States. Yeah. Uh, it is highly likely one in nine young men in the US ends up in prison at some point in the journey of their life. Uh, incarceration rate in the UK for 3.8% of the UK population are black, 13% of the prison population are black. The disproportions are extreme. If you're black in the UK, you're 10 times more likely to be stopped and harassed, they say searched, I say harassed yes. by the police. If in the US and you go to prison, your right to vote is withdrawn. You cease to be part of the democratic framework of a country where where Martin Luther King fought for democratic rights, yes. but you can't participate anymore. And so many of the caseload of black men in prison in the US are down to very small felons, not extremes, not, 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 not incarcerations based on violence, but just small actions where people fell foul of the law and it's an instantaneous prison sentence. In fact, black men both in the US and the UK are three times more likely to go to prison than white men are. Now that long, injustice, that tale of aggressive, angry, judicial and police behavior towards the, as they call it, African-American, we'd say black community sure. here, yes. that long tale of aggressive behavior that has boiled out as a result of the murder, the killing of George Floyd, where everybody could witness in those horrendous, horrendous eight minutes and 49 seconds, we could all see for ourselves that somebody was being brought to death by a man who ought to protect for life. Yes. So this is the, it's almost like the final, this is, this is the end of what had been a peace pact for, for decades. Absolutely. And it's not that, and I'm glad to say, Time Magazine accorded that 93% of all the protests in the US since the killing of George Floyd in May 2020, 93% of all the protests have been peaceful with not one arrest. So the idea that black people spilling onto the streets yeah. is being violent and aggressive and anti-state is not the case at all. It's exactly the opposite. But that said, it's a little bit like the way in which Gandhi, of course, believed very firmly that resistance to imperial powers in India was the right way to eventually bring about the freedom of that enormous country. Did he endorse acts of violence? No, but he did absolutely endorse very determined and deliberate interventions, strong protests and resistances. And that's what's happening at the moment. I would say if you're black, British or American or in a country where you feel discrimination is evident, you've had enough. Yes. So how are we going to press on um, and overcome all of this racism that still permeates society? Well, there is a need for the recognition of what is systemic yes. within the structures of how society operates, discriminations in employment processes and practices, discriminations in recruitment, discriminations in pay and evaluation, discriminations in policing behavior, discriminations in incarceration, discriminations in the probation system. Whichever way you look, there are discriminations and even in the healthcare system, recent surveys showing that two thirds of black women feel that they get a poorer deal out of the National Health Service in the UK than white women do. That may be partially perception, but that perception is a reality to their experience. So, so we have to really take the root and branch look at those systemic embedded evils yes. and pull them up, be willing to pull them up and deal with them. It's important as, as uh, Sir William McPherson acknowledged way back in the early 1990s that there is institutional racism in other words, it's in the structure of expectations and behaviours. It's how police conduct themselves. It's 
how teachers look at classes of children and talk about low aspiration outcomes as compared to high aspiration potentials. It's there in the mindset of people. We, we had this very recent story of a, of a young woman who is a black barrister going into a court in London and the officers of the court assumed she had to be the person to be tried. Yes. Just because she was black. But she was there to defend the person to be tried. And she had to make the case three times in literally 20 minutes to different people that she was there as a barrister with the right to be in the court. That's remarkable. It's, it's shocking, isn't no, it? No, it is shocking. It is shocking. And it illustrates a mindset that says black and young, to yeah. a large extent, because the, the feeling is black and older, well, you've been here doing the basic jobs for a long time. You're not much of a threat. Black and young, you're probably just on the kind of grabbing around sure. slate of life. And that's how we'll treat you. Well, that but is... But that's appalling. A, but I mean, employees of a court yes. should treat everybody yeah. with respect. I irrespective. 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 And should Absolutely. Have, even if she was the person to be challenged in court, she should have been spoken to with dignity and respect. Absolutely. Not with dismissiveness. But the fact that the assumption was there was overwhelming. I mean, I actually had, and this is a true statement, a policeman in the car park of the House of Lords tap on my window to say to me that this was not an area that I should park in because the chauffeurs who wait for the Lords park down there. What did you say? I got out of the vehicle. I reminded him that he was a public servant. Yes that I was here by the privilege of Her Majesty's appointment, yes. that is my responsibility for my duty in the Palace of Westminster and his to serve the public interest. Did he apologise? He did. But that understanding of public duty... I know. You, you know, put, on a, put on a jacket, put on a uniform on some people, and they are transformed from being a public servant into a power play. Well, that culture doesn't go with washing the feet of those no, it doesn't. around you. And this necessity to demonstrate the simplicity of being willing to be a servant, and that's a joy. Obviously, Michael, you are a Christian. You are a practicing Christian. You have Christian convictions. Uh, you believe in, in Christian biblical values uh, and principles. Um, are you hopeful uh, for change? Are you hopeful for transformation? Are you an optimist? Oh, I've always been an optimist. All, all the many decades of my life, I've always been an optimist. And, and I've always been an optimist because I have seen so many remarkable and wonderful people in every corner of the world. I've seen generous, engaged, philanthropic, sacrificial, passionate people doing kind, overwhelming and significant things. And even from the smallest things possible, right through the way through to the grandest positions that people can occupy in a business or in government. I've seen the beauty of the human soul in constant expression. Sad to say, the parade of the media is always the negative or dominated by the negative. If something awful has happened, we get volumes of it. Something good has happened that finds its way onto the back page. But I am an optimist. I am an optimist. I, I am, I'm sad at the moment by, by one particular statistic I read literally just a few days ago, which is which has given my passion to see the end of extreme poverty and hunger, to see the sustainable development goals met as a result of coronavirus, COVID-19 in 2020. Whereas we were seeing the figures of the extreme poor in the world going down from what used to be 2 billion down to around about 1.3 billion, then down now to about 650 million, mainly in sub-Saharan Africa, they've shot up by another 400 million. So we're back at the billion by the end of this year. And that, that, that has put progress back by 30 years because getting those figures down again is going to be very hard. Economies are being vulnerable and trashed and weakened as a consequence of this. And what is so important for African development is trade. It's where, where countries produce goods that everybody in the world wants to buy and commodities that we want to buy and trade on. So my, I'm, I'm an optimist, but I'm frustrated that we end up marginalizing the poor again and which is exactly the opposite of what Jesus would have done. What do we need? Do we need a, another great awakening, another revival? Um, is that something we need? Yes we do. We, we need a radical revival of the mind and the spirit. 
We need people to know who God is, to know that life comes through our awareness of, pre uh, identification with, journey with, walking with Jesus. There is life to be found in discovering who, who is the creator of life, that our spirits come alive in his presence. We need that. But, you know, there are a lot of religious people in the world who, uh, as Jesus said, claim his identity, but don't live his way. And I, I share with all of those that I get the joy to share, Matthew chapter 25, when I was thirsty, you brought me something to drink. When I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was homeless, you found me shelter. When I was in prison, you visited me. And I was on a call the other night and people were asking about, how do we find our purpose? I said, it's so easy. Get out there and serve the people who can't survive. We don't need to be given a boom from above that says, you know, come on, man, here you go. Go and rescue the whale at the bottom of the Antarctic. Yes, we need to absolutely abundantly protect and quite rightly the environment. Our purpose is to fulfill with dignity the opportunity to bring life to others Absolutely. and Jesus set out exactly how to do that and that's why I'm committed again to the sustainable development goals because if we don't fight for the poor because we believe that they deserve utter dignity life and love in the same way that we take it then what on earth are we believing in absolutely and people Michael don't care how much we know until they know how much we care yes exactly I love that exactly Isn't it? that exactly that I know yeah and I tell people all the time, listen, G, the, Paul had this phrase, he talked about being the aroma of Christ. And, and, and you know, when there's a strong perfume on someone, yes. you, you smell it before they you come do. in the room. Yeah. And then it lingers in the room and it's there for days afterwards, that strong. Well, that's what the presence of Jesus is like. Well, Michael, I've known you for three decades. We've been great friends for 23 years. You definitely exude the aroma of Christ. Um, thank you for sharing with us. And I love your passion and uh, the way that you think. And you're a practitioner. And uh, I commend you, my dear friend. Thank you for joining us thank on you. Facing the Canon. Thank you. Thank you. Lord Michael Hastings. I know he's a great friend of mine, but every time I'm with him, I'm inspired. I, I find him refreshing and I also find him challenging. Um, it, it's not just theory, it really is practice. It's, it's actually doing it, not just saying it. And I hope that's challenged you. I hope it's inspired you. Um, we can't help everyone, but we can help someone. And I hope from this, conversation today it will inspire you to help someone else in some way thank you for joining us on facing the canon please join us again <laughs>